Hey, how's it going, church? It is so good to be with you here today. Here are a few things that are coming up and that you should know. Our slice of summer is continuing. After the excitement of this past week's game with Jared, uh, we're gonna go a little bit more low key this week. Join us Friday evening at 6.30 p.m. for a movie night in the kid zone. We are gonna be watching the new Tom and Jerry movie with popcorn provided. Bring your own blanket or your comfy chair to sit on and enjoy a movie night with your family. Wanna connect in a summer small group? There is still time to join in. This eight-week study on Corinthians is available Monday and Wednesday evenings here at the church. For more details and to sign up, go to efreelethbridge.ca slash summer. Don't forget, at the 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. on-site services, we are offering supervised kids ministry alongside our worship services. Or pick up an activity box for each child that is suited to their age and stage and sit in the church together as a family during the service. Thanks so much for being part of our church family today, whether you're watching online or you're attending in person. Now, over to your host. Thanks, Mike. I'll add my welcome to each and every one of you here. Thank you for joining us here on this holiday weekend. I have had a great summer so far, being able to go out and to visit some relatives, visit some friends, just enjoy the weather that we've been having here, and I hope you have as well. And uh, as we come together here today to worship God and to spend time together as the family of God, uh, I encourage you to turn your hearts to God and be thankful for Him. Uh, Psalm 139 is particularly apropos as some of us have been traveling around. It says in verse 3, You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before you say it. And you go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. That's what our God does. He sees us no matter where we're at. And he comes, he goes ahead of us and he comes behind us. And he wants to pour out his blessing upon us. So let's pray for that today. My prayer for you is that God will bless you as we worship together today. God, we come before you. Thank you so much that uh, you are a God who sees us, who loves us, and who blesses us. So pour out your blessing upon us here today. Amen. Remember to grab your communion elements. We'll be doing that after the message here today, but let's worship God together.
the splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great Our God is a great God who gives so much to us. He pours out his blessing on us. And so as we come just to talk about our offering time here and give you an opportunity to give even though we're online, I just want to remind you of how gracious and great our God is. Jesus, when he was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, Luke chapter 6, says this in verse 38, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. And so, I mean, the interesting image there is this essence of, and it's almost like, you know, pouring, uh, pouring like flour or grain or whatever into a cup or receptacle like this. And, and Jesus is saying, if you give to God, Here's what happens. God comes and he pours out his blessing on you. And this blessing is such that he's just going to pour it into your cup. And he's going to pour it in so that not only can you press it down, put, stack it in there, as much blessing as possible, but it is going to pour and overflow. That's the heart of God. As we trust him with our resources, whether it is our money, and in this circumstance we're talking about that, whether it is our time, whether it is uh, you know, just investing in something else, uh, God will bless us and pour out his blessing upon us in many and varied ways. And as we trust him, he trusts us with his blessing. 
And so an opportunity to do that today to give, uh, I would encourage you to give, give to the ministry here, uh, give to what other things God allows you to uh, in your life, any other uh, places that you see need your investment. Be generous people and see what God does to bless you. So let me pray uh, for our offering. God, I'm so thankful that uh, you are a great God who blesses us. And I love when we give, you say that you are going to bless us. And you will bless us not just a little bit, but a lot. And this blessing will be poured in, pressed down, and overflow. What a great, great image that is. So we thank you for that today. We lift our hearts to you and we worship you together. Amen. So if you want to take your Bibles and uh, open up uh, to Matthew chapter 27, uh, my friend Dot is joining us here. Hi, Dot. How you doing? Good morning, Jeff. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. And Dot is going to be reading for us in just a moment here uh, from this. And we're going to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus. But uh, Dot, I just want to ask you a couple questions. How long have you been coming to E-Free? Um, I started coming to E-Free in about 2009. So okay. about 12 years now. About 12 years. That's great. When did you move uh, into Lethbridge? Um, I moved from Calgary in 2005. So I've okay. been here 16 years. Right on. That's great. Now, when you moved into town, you didn't have a bunch of relationships here and you were looking to get connected. How did you do that? How did you get connected? Well, when I first moved down, it was for work. And so, you know, what I decided was if I was moving to a new place, I was going to invest my time and build my relationships in, in that place. So um, I just, you know, made the decision that I wasn't going to go home every weekend or go back to Calgary, but instead I would I would connect with um, co-workers and, and people that I, I would meet and just kind of took took that step out. And, you know, um, when opportunities came up or, or when... Um, when something came up, I'd, I'd say yes to these opportunities and just build those relationships. Cool. Ah, oh, that's great. And so now it's, you've been here 15, 16 years and you're connected. What benefits have you seen to being connected to a community like you are here at uh, eFree? So for me, it's more important to be connected. Like eFree is such a big church and mm -hmm. I, I really actually appreciate the more intimate um, relationships that I have. So being a part of small group is, is very important to me. And, and just the benefits of that have been um, walking this life journey together, um, having that accountability and encouragement. Um, and it's hard in a big group, right, to say, you know, to share with everyone. But, but in a small group, you have, you have a small group of friends and you can tell them a lot more. And um, I, I, I like the intimacy of that small group. And I... Um, and it's just been really encouraging to have a group of friends that I can go to. Uh, we're doing life together. We're having this, you know, we're encouraging each other in our walk with God. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dot, for uh, bearing testimony to that. And that's something we want to continue to emphasize, particularly as we move into the fall. People gathering together in smaller groups so that they can build these deep relationships and care for one another and encourage each other in this way. But Matthew chapter 27 uh, will you read that passage for us here? Hopefully you've taken the time, if you're watching us here, to open up your Bibles and uh, let us know where you're going to be reading and then you can step right into it, Dot. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 to 28, verse 10. So chapter 27, verse 62. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember what the deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, Take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, 
rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you very much, Dot. Appreciate it. Have a great day. You too, Jeff. Thank you. Good morning, church. It is so great to be with you today. Today, we are diving right back into the creed. Now, if you've been following with us this summer, you will know that over the last few weeks, we have been taking a closer look at the Apostles' Creed as a reminder of what we believe. This statement is a declaration of what we as a church believe. It is a unifying document, something that we can all come around and declare with one voice. These are the essentials that are the foundation of what we believe. Last week, Joel led us through Jesus' suffering and crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, and today we are going to be looking at the next chapter in that story that comes to us three days later. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, but on the third day, he rose again from the dead. So today we're talking about the resurrection and I wanted to start off by looking at some common responses to Jesus's resurrection because a lot of people can struggle with the story of the resurrection. We may doubt it, disbelieve it, or just flat out deny it. And I think that we find all of these reactions in the resurrection accounts. How could they not have even had some doubt when they first got the news? Jesus died and dead people don't rise again, especially not three days after they had died. Though it has led to an unfortunate label for himself, Thomas's doubt actually makes a lot of sense. If some people came to you telling you that a loved one who had died a few days before had been seen and was alive, would you just take them at their word? Maybe they saw a vision. Maybe their grief led them to see their loved ones standing there, but that doesn't mean that they're alive. It doesn't mean that they've risen from the dead. And so we get doubting Thomas. Though he had experienced many miracles of Jesus and had seen things never before seen, he could not bring himself to believe his own friends when they said Jesus was alive because things like this just don't happen. I'll believe it when I see it. Another response that we may see in today's passage, though, is to deny it. This is what the priests do when they find out the tomb is empty. And the response is so fascinating to me. They did everything within their power to prevent Jesus' body from leaving that tomb. They sealed the tomb, they posted a guard, and yet, when the tomb was empty, they flat out deny that Jesus was risen from the dead. The soldiers reported what they saw. The guards saw an angel whose appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And when they finally come to, the body of Jesus was gone. The priests take what they know to be true. Jesus was a criminal condemned to die. And the dead people don't rise from the dead. And so they spread the report that Jesus' disciples came in the night and stole the body of Jesus while the guards were sleeping. They broke the seal, rolled back the stone, all while not disturbing a sleeping guard of trained soldiers. This is the only possible explanation. 
Now, not surprisingly, these responses of doubt and denial have carried forward until today. While I was researching for this, I found a survey that the BBC conducted back in 2017. They surveyed 2,000 people in England, asking them about what they thought about the biblical account of resurrection. Now, out of those 2,000 people that were surveyed, only 30% of those who professed to be Christians believed in the Bible's version of the resurrection. Now, this was higher among those that they described as active Christians, but this is still a remarkably low number. Again, out of these 2,000 people that were surveyed, a quarter of those who professed to be Christians did not believe in the resurrection altogether. Now, this is crazy. People who have faith in God, people who would claim to be Christians who believe in Jesus' death, would deny the resurrection. Now, this is amazing because to say you are a Christian, to say you have faith but deny the resurrection, according to the Bible, makes no sense. According to Paul, this is a theological absurdity. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, Tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you telling me there's no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection from the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In this case, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. You see, Jesus' death and resurrection are entirely inseparable. You cannot have one of them without the other. If you deny the resurrection, then the cross loses its power. And so to say that you have faith in Christ, but deny the resurrection doesn't work. It simply doesn't make sense. Jesus rose from the dead. This we believe. Now, one of the things that I find a little intriguing around this question of the resurrection, did it happen, did it not happen, is that we can tend to think of it as if this is somehow a modern problem. As if now that we have become enlightened and we have the scientific method, we now understand that dead people don't come back to life. And therefore, as enlightened people, we're no longer capable of believing in a doctrine that says that Jesus, who was crucified and buried, who died, came back to life on the third day. However, and this really should come as no surprise, the people of Jesus' day also knew that dead people did not come back to life. The disbelief and the denial that we experience today was the same disbelief and denial that they felt when people started saying, Jesus has risen from the dead. It made no sense. There was no expectation of an immediate resurrection. Remember back to the story of Lazarus in the Gospel of John? Jesus said to Mary, your brother will rise again. And what is Mary's response? I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last days. That was the resurrection that they believed in, something that happened in the last days. But there was no hope for anything sooner. And so would the case be here. The fact that so quickly after Jesus' death, there was this belief that he had risen from the dead cannot be attributed to the fact that they just didn't know any better. It had to have come as the result of people being presented with evidence that was so solid that they could no longer doubt, no matter how little it made sense within their world understanding. After doubting that Jesus had risen, Jesus appeared to Thomas. And when Thomas saw Jesus standing there, when he saw the body of Jesus, all his doubt vanished to the point that he declared, my Lord and my God, and worshiped him. Now, I don't want to spend all of my time today turning this into an apologetic, arguing that the resurrection happened. But as the creed so clearly states, we believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and on the third day rose again. So this is something that we all believe, but I want to be clear. This is not just a blind leap of faith. This is something that we have reason to believe. There is evidence to support our faith. One thing we may notice about the resurrection is the varying accounts that we have in the four Gospels. Now, it's not as if the Gospels are drastically different in the way that they describe the resurrection and what happened after, but there are differences. And for some, this might be a problem. 
I mean, the Gospels can't even get the story straight, it seems. Who did Jesus appear to first? Who was the first to enter the tomb? But rather than being evidence to the contrary, this actually supports our belief in the resurrection. If you called in four different eyewitnesses to testify to an event that they had observed, and they all gave the exact same description, word for word, from four different vantage points, you would actually trust them less. If this was a court of law, those testimonies would now be suspect because there was no variance between them. These must have been created or manufactured stories. But that is not what we get in the Gospels. Instead, we have four different accounts from four different people who are trying to describe the same thing. An event that happened outside of themselves that each of them observed and are trying to record it and write it down. You see, something did happen. There is this event that happened when, and they are all witness to it. And they're trying to describe in detail what they saw. Another thing that stood out to me as I studied this passage is the story that surrounds Jesus' resurrection and the story of the women at the tomb. At the end of Matthew 27, we see the Pharisees coming to Pilate and saying, you know, we remember that Jesus used to say that in three days he would rise again. So please, let us make it secure or else his disciples are going to come and steal the body and start saying that he has risen from the dead and this deception is going to be even worse than the first one. And so they post a guard and they seal the tomb in order to make it secure. Only there's one problem. Three days after sealing the tomb and posting that guard, the tomb is now empty and the guards and the Pharisees now have to give a reason for it. Now in chapter 28, starting in verse 11, we hear the report of the guards who went to the chief priests and described everything that happened. And Matthew says that when the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan and gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say that his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we're sleeping. And Matthew says that the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. To th so think about it. Matthew, writing to an audience not long after Jesus' death, is giving an account for a widely circulated saying. Apparently, it was a common rumor going around that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body. What does that tell you? The body wasn't in the tomb anymore. That doesn't actually seem to be the debate in the day. They are arguing over why the tomb was empty. You see, the empty tomb is a problem that confronts all of us. Either a group of disciples came and stole Jesus' body while a group of Roman soldiers were asleep at the sealed tomb, or we must take the gospel writers at their word and believe that Jesus' body was no longer there because he had risen from the dead. Even though it made no sense in their culture, even though they were aware that people do not rise from the dead, there was so much evidence there that Jesus had risen from the tomb that the disciples had no choice but to believe in the risen king. So, Jesus rose from the dead. But what does this mean for us? What is the significance of his resurrection? Why does Paul say that if Christ did not rise from the dead, then your faith is useless and you are still in your sins? I think we can get a good sense of what happened at Jesus' resurrection if we continue reading on in 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 54, Paul declares this. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the resurrection of Jesus represents his victory over sin and death. As God said in the garden in the very beginning, in the day that Adam and Eve disobeyed, when they sinned, they would die. And so through the first act of disobedience, sin entered the world, and through sin, death entered the world. Sin is the sting that results in death. Sin and death are inseparable, and they have reigned with no rival from the garden until Jesus. But Jesus' death on the cross was not just a payment for sin. 
Through his resurrection, we see that his death and now his resurrection powerfully demonstrated his utter and complete victory over sin and death, reversing the power that had reigned over all of creation from the first day. Jesus defeated sin and death, and that has led us to two things that I want to explore deeper today. Jesus' victory over death has led us to hope, and Jesus' victory over sin has led us to new life. So, first off, Jesus' victory over death leads to hope. This hope is evidenced in all the accounts of the resurrection. I mean, don't you find it interesting what the Pharisees said? Let us seal the tomb because we remember that Jesus had said, in three days I will rise again. This was clearly an understood and remembered teaching of Jesus. Even the Pharisees are quoting it. And their fear is that the disciples were going to come and steal the body in order to further deceive the people. So, where are the disciples? From all the accounts of the resurrection, it doesn't seem like this thought had ever even crossed their minds. We don't see any disciples eagerly waiting in anticipation of Jesus' resurrection. What we see is a group of disciples in fear and in hiding, in darkness and in hopelessness. We see disciples in mourning. And why? Because all of their hopes that they had placed into Jesus had come to an end in his death. There was no hope of an immediate resurrection. That was not an anticipated event in the life of the Messiah. Their hope was that Jesus would inaugurate a new kingdom here on earth, and his death had been the final nail in the coffin that was those dreams. They had backed the wrong person. There was no other possible explanation for Jesus' death. His death on the cross plunged his disciples into utter hopelessness and despair, into mourning and darkness. And it was into this hopelessness and this darkness that Jesus' resurrection broke into on that third day. Now, I don't know your story. I don't know what you're going through with this last year, what it's been like for you with COVID. I don't know the many other things that could be going on in your life, but I know that each one of us knows what it is to face this darkness and this hopelessness. Each one of us knows what it is to come face to face with sickness and death. We know what it is to lose the people we love the most, and we know the despair that it can bring. But Jesus' resurrection says that this is not the end. Jesus, his resurrection says that this story has not been finished. His resurrection declares that death itself has been overcome because death could not hold Jesus in the tomb. We have hope in Jesus. And this hope is central to the Christian faith. It is impossible to push forward apart from this hope. This confidence in a future beyond death, in the future after the grave. Hebrews 11 verse 1 is an incredibly well-known verse. And it declares that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. And it's the evidence of things we cannot see. It's the reality of what we hope for. And then it goes on to describe the lives of the saints from the first day until now. In a passage that has commonly been referred to as the hall of faith the examples of faith. And what is incredible about the majority of these stories is that they are stories of people who never on this earth fully realized the promise they had received. These people died still believing what God had promised them, even though they did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. Many people were rescued by faith. Many people received their dead back through faith. But in verse 35, we read this, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. 
for God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. None of this is possible apart from hope. None of these things could occur apart from the confidence that there is something more after death. That is why Paul declares that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we of all people are the most to be pitied. Having faith in Christ and being obedient to God can cost people dearly. Some people are thrown into prison for their faith. Some in Paul's day lost their homes. And if we do not have hope, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we truly are above all people most to be pitied. But thanks be to God that Jesus reigned victorious over sin and death. That his crucifixion was not the end of the story. And through his resurrection, Jesus defeated death. We are saved in hope and into hope. Let's take some time to reflect on our own story. Are you currently walking through darkness and hopelessness? How can Christ's victory over death bring hope to you today? So, Jesus' victory over death has led us into hope. Now let's look at his victory over sin. Because in the resurrection, Jesus' victory over sin has led us into new life. Now, thankfully, Joel did an incredible job last week and was getting a little bit ahead of himself and preaching on the resurrection, which has been great because I feel like he did my job for me. But really, he was right to preach on the resurrection because the death and the resurrection of Christ are truly inseparable. You cannot talk about one without also talking about the other. The resurrection informs us on what actually happened during Jesus' crucifixion. You see, the resurrection says that Jesus did not die merely to pay for our sins. Jesus died so that he might overcome sin and thus overcome death as well. On the cross, all of the sins of all people were laid on him. The sinless son of God nailed to a tree bearing our guilt. My sin was on his shoulders. But my sin, your sin, our sin was not able to overcome the sinless son of God. Though Jesus bore the sin of all people for all time, and the penalty for that sin, which is death, did not stick to him. And in the resurrection of Jesus, we see that Jesus has overcome sin. Jesus reigns victorious over sin. And I think what is so sad is that so many of us don't live in this victory. So many of us live as if Jesus merely paid for our sins. Like Joel talked about, we treat his grace like a vending machine, dispensing the grace whenever we need it. We treat it like this, this credit card that has no limit, so that even though I continue to walk in sin, he's paid it all, and I have nothing to worry about. But that is not what Jesus came to do. He did not just come as yet another sacrifice, as yet another payment for sin. That's what the law was for. That's what the sacrificial system of Israel was for. God had already made a way for his people to pay for their sins. Jesus came to deal with sin once and for all. Through Jesus' resurrection, we have the hope of new life. And yet so many of us feel trapped in our sin, as if there's just no hope of ever leaving it behind. But that is simply not what we see in the Bible. You can find this talk of new life in so many places. But we'll take Romans 6 as an example, where Paul is answering this rhetorical question, should we keep on sinning so that God can show more and more of his grace? Now, the more that sin abounds, the more that grace abounds, so that God is glorified. And so one could make this rather misguided but logical argument that if we sin more, there will be more grace and God will receive more glory. But Paul simply says this is impossible. We can no longer go on sinning. And in verse 5 of chapter 6, we read this. 
Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. This is the power of the resurrection. We are no longer slaves to sin. And this is not to put the weight of holiness back on you. This isn't saying that the chains are off. You're now free to walk in sinless perfection on your own. This is accomplished through the power of Jesus' resurrection and through the power of his spirit living inside of us. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. And like Paul goes on to say later in Romans 8, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. The power of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And so you no longer have any obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You have been set free and you have been given the strength to overcome. And this is not of yourselves. This is the work of God. This is our identity in Christ. This is what the resurrection means for each and every one of us. So what is our response going to be? Are we going to walk in? and live in the power of his spirit and in the power of Jesus' resurrection? Or are we going to stay in our own prisons, sitting in our own cells, living as slaves to sin when Christ has broken the chains and opened the door? Let us live in the power of Jesus' resurrection and the freedom that it brings. Let us be a people who are marked by hope and new life. This is the power of Jesus' resurrection for us. This we believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son who so What a reminder of the great gift that we've been given through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have for the future. We have hope not only for eternity, but we have hope for new life now. Freedom from sin. And we can walk in the confidence of this. So that's the reminder that we have as we come to the communion table today. So if you have your elements there, the cup and the bread, uh, let's walk through communion together and let's remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior who sacrificed himself for our sake. It says in Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins, for I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was ushered in by Jesus' death and his resurrection. 
And so now we can live in this hope that Matt spoke about from God's word. And we are reminded of that. And so that's what we're going to celebrate here today. And so in verse 17, it says, Then Jesus took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And so let's take the cup and let's thank God for it. God, we thank you so much for this cup that is a reminder of Jesus' blood that was poured out for our sake for the forgiveness of sins. And we have new life because our sins have been forgiven, our sins have been paid for. And that's what we remember as we come and we drink this cup, which represents Christ's blood shed for our sake. In your precious name, amen. And so Jesus said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink the cup again until the kingdom of God comes. Let's partake together. And then it says in verse 19, Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. So let's give God thanks for this. God, thank you for sending your son who came and allowed his body to be broken on the cross for our sake so that we could have hope so that when our bodies, our physical bodies uh, here are done with this life, that we will have resurrection bodies and a hope for the future. Thank you so much that we have this hope for eternity and we give you praise today for that. Thank you for the reminder that this bread is for that sake and we ask for your blessing upon it now. Amen. It says, then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples and he said this, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's partake together in remembrance of Jesus' body broken for our sake. Thank you very much, Savior, Lord, Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King for the hope that you give us for now and for eternity. We give you praise. Amen. I shall hold to the cross. I shall hold to God alone for his love salvaged me for his love has said They 
Our hope is in Jesus Christ who came back from the dead, that we will have a life here that can be lived in holiness and free from sin, and that we can also look forward uh, to this time where we are resurrected in heaven with our Savior. And it says in Romans 8, verse 31, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he give us everything else? That's who God is. He is for us. He gave us everything. He gave us his one and only son so that we could experience this brand new life and the hope that results. That's the hope that we can go with. That's the hope that unites us. That's the hope that unites us around this table. And that's the hope that we have and the unity that we have as we read this creed together and we're preaching it through uh, this summer. So let's read the creed together. Wherever you're at right now, why don't you read this with me here? This encapsulates our beliefs. It says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Have a great week, church.